Well, welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us tonight at this presentation. My name is Michelle Diaz and I'm Trace Atlanta Education Program Manager. I'm gonna be the facilitator for tonight's presentation on the topic of amphibian decline and the importance of habitat restoration. Trees Atlanta mission is to protect and improve Atlanta's forest by planting conservation and education. This is one of our many educational programs. We host education programs year round. So I invite you to visit our website, treesatlanta.org calendar to check out more volunteer and education programs. This is gonna be an interactive conversation with the speaker. So you're welcome to send questions through the chat through the presentation. And he'll also be answering questions at the end. So use the, you can use the Q&A feature and you can use the chat feature and I'll be moderating them. At the end of the presentation and in a survey email, you'll get a survey and we'll love your feedback. We'll love to learn more about what type of programs are you interested in? What do you think about this program? Any ideas that you'd like to share with us? And please sign up for our newsletter. That's the way to stay in touch with what's going on in the organization, the programs that we're bringing, treesatlanta.org and follow us on social media. Our speaker tonight is Mark Mandica. He's the founder and executive director of the Amphibian Foundation. Mark, thank you for being here with us tonight. Um, we are so much looking forward for this topic. Great. Well, thank you very much. It's my pleasure to be here. Good evening, everybody. Um, um, thanks for inviting me to come and talk with you all about amphibians. Uh, obviously, my favorite topic. Uh, so let's uh, get started. I've got some nice pictures. Well, hopefully, you'll think they're nice pictures to share. So here we go. Okay, hopefully everybody can see that okay. Looks good. Okay, good. All right, so yes, amphibian declines. Um, and like Michelle mentioned, I am the executive director of the Amphibian Foundation located here in Atlanta. And we're gonna talk about these three species uh, soon, but in case you are unfamiliar, these are three of the, probably the most endangered amphibian species here in Georgia and in the Southeast, the gopher frog, uh, the striped newt in the middle and the frosted flatwood salamander. And so I like to just make sure we're all on the same page and that we know what we're talking about with the amphibians, obviously the frogs and the toads and the salamanders, but there's also this third group called the Sicilians. And some people aren't familiar with them, but these goofy, limbless, uh, burrowing amphibians. Unfortunately, we don't have any Sicilians living here in Georgia, but I just love them so much. So I, I try to take any opportunity I can to, to let people know about them. Um, and so they're a tropical, pan-tropical species. They're everywhere where it's really warm. They're mysterious and they live underground. And then I thought I'd showcase this thing, the spotted salamander. And um, this is actually native Metro Atlanta species. Um, and this is the thing that made me the way I am because when I was an undergrad, I uh, was lucky enough to do a research project on this species and they just really charmed me. But look at that face, they are charming species. And I guess you could probably define, divide my life to, before I met these spotted salamanders and after. And so um, that was in the 90s and I'm still working with this species today. But just look at how cute they are. This is a little baby. They're just always smiling. And so uh, spotted salamanders and, and uh, my, yeah, all of the species we're working with now are all um, restricted to these ephemeral wetlands. And, uh, the, what we're going to be highlighting during this talk is, is the relationship between amphibians and their habitat and how important it is to restore 
and manage the habitat. And so spotted salamanders and a lot of other amphibians here in Metro Atlanta use these ephemeral wetlands. And so they're temporary or seasonal pools. That's not the type of wetland that most people think twice about, but this is where I've been focusing all of my research attention since I first met spotted salamanders. So they are a vital ecosystem for uh, um, more than a quarter of Atlanta's amphibians. Lots of amphibians will use an ephemeral wetland. This is a little bit more than a puddle. Some ephemeral wetlands are much larger, um, but there are a significant number of species that will only use an ephemeral wetland. And those are the, those are the ones that I study. Um, and so the, the big part of, of an ephemeral wetland is that they dry out every year. So they hold water for months at a time. And so that prohibits fish from living in them. And fish love to eat amphibians. So it works out for the amphibians, but it does put a huge time crunch on these things where they need to get in and breed and then have their larvae metamorphose before the pond dries out. So it's a race against time. Um, one thing to talk about with amphibians and habitat is that, you know, these amphibian species do not live in these ephemeral wetlands. They breed in them. They live in the uplands. And so for all of these species, they need two intact habitats. They need their upland and they need their wetland. And they need access to both. They need to be go back and forth. So I've drew this little diagram of a marbled salamander in a, a hypothetical migratory route because these all these amphibians are migratory. They migrate into their wetlands every year. There's some really fascinating things about this too. These species exhibit site fidelity. So the same little puddle they were born in, they return to every year. Uh, as, as much as 80, 90% of these animals will return to the little puddle they were born in every year. So if you're talking from a conservation standpoint, it's very important that those little puddles are, are maintained, that they're there and not filled in or turned into a parking lot or all of the other horrible things that happen to these ephemeral wetlands because they're gonna return there the next year, whether the, their little wetland is there or not. Uh, like I said, they're, they're up in the uplands for a, mostly 50 weeks of the year um, and they'll just come down to breed. Nobody knows how they find their little overwintering site, but they return to the same one every year. And that's pretty, pretty impressive seeing as they're like less than an inch up off the ground. And so, you know, migrations, you think of, uh, you know, some of the, you know, birds or wildebeests or something that have these long dramatic migrations, but for a, a tiny salamander, you know, 500 meters is, is quite a long migration. And then it's about three times that long for frogs. So what does a salamander migration look like? This is what a salamander migration looks like. And this is what I witnessed when I was an undergrad and it just blew my mind. Let's see all these salamanders migrating to their breeding pond all at once. Um, it went from seeing zero salamanders to basically seeing all the salamanders. And I, uh, I was doing this up north in Massachusetts. So it also happened to be uh, freezing and there was snow on the ground. And so this was all happening over the snow. I was freezing and these little salamanders just didn't seem to be bothered. I'd also point out because we are here in Atlanta, or I am here in Atlanta, that um, these migrations are often um, obstructed. So, you know, many of these obligate ephemeral wetland breeding amphibians travel the same route every year to and from. And if there's a road built, and this happens often, if there's a road constructed in between the upland and the breeding site, then these salamanders are gonna be forced to cross it twice a year at least, you know, one to get there and one to go back. So there's a very high potential for, for road mortality. 
Um, so up north, there was the very first salamander crossing in the, in the country. And um, this was built right down the road from where I went to school. So I was just very lucky to get to see this salamander crossing. And uh, th this is where a culvert was built under the road for the salamanders. So rather than having to cross the street, they could go under it. And at Henry Street in Amherst, in March, um, on the first rainy night, you'll see families out there. Um, and this is the most coddled group of spotted salamanders I know of, um, where the families are literally carrying these salamanders to their breeding pond, the ones that would choose to go over the road rather than through the culvert are coddled. Um, and so it's very sweet and it's a big event. And, um, and that's just a really cool thing I like to tell people. Uh, other places you'll see these roads are closed during salamander migrations. And I'd like to think that people are, you know, don't mind when they're like trying to get home from work and they, the road is closed because there's a salamander migration. Hopefully everyone's willing to do what's necessary to protect these things. <laughs> And then again, I've already pointed it out, but sometimes it's just nice to see a salamander on the snow and that happens quite, nor quite uh, normally. Here's a pair of breeding salamanders with the temperature gun showing you that it's 16 degrees. So it's well below freezing and they're in the mood for love. These are an animal that can super cool, which means that they can go below freezing and not freeze. Okay, that's a little intro to uh, why I am what I am and why I am how I am and the types of uh, amphibians that I, I focused on. But I also want to point out that these uh, amphibians are declining worldwide. And this is why we started the Amphibian Foundation was to try to address some of these declines, particularly in the southeastern United States. So um, today I got the, the recent tally. There are currently 8,425 known species of amphibians. 43% of them are documented as in decline or already extinct. So right now there is a simultaneous loss of over 3,500 species and that's around the world. And so that's just a, obviously a tremendous amount of species. It's almost half of the world's amphibians are, are declining as we speak. So I like to highlight some of these species that we have lost or are losing. You know, in the bottom left, that's the Panamanian golden frog. It's extinct in the wild. You can see them in at Zoo Atlanta of all places, really close. You can go see um, Panamanian golden frogs there. Uh, zoos like Zoo Atlanta are doing really well with keeping them alive in captivity but they're uh, extinct in Panama. In the top left, the gastric brooding frog is a species where the male would swallow the eggs, shut off his digestive system, and let the little babies cook in his stomach until they climb right out uh, when they're ready. Um, that species is, is extinct, has not been seen since 1980. Um, in the bottom right, the Montverde toad, also hasn't been seen since the 80s. And then the top right, the Rab's fringe limb tree frog, the last known Rab's fringe limb tree frog died in September of 2016, right here in Atlanta. Um, and so I have Google Tuffy there if you're interested, because this as a Panamanian species that was rescued. Um, and unfortunately, we we're unable to keep this species alive. Um, and the last one died in 2016. So he was um, pretty famous. His name was Tuffy. Uh, he's got his own Wikipedia page. I don't, I don't know who put that together, but I had the pleasure of working with this frog for about seven years. Uh, in that time, he actually had some media attention uh, National Geographic, and then the Huffington Post, also the Atlantic. And he was in um, a documentary called Racing Extinction, which is a great documentary. I would recommend being in a really good mood 
before you see it, but um, if you want to see that, and I was impressed that they wanted to cover amphibians in this documentary about the extinction crisis because, you know, it's it's hard to get a lot of attention for amphibians. Uh, generally speaking, people don't really think twice about amphibians, to, to be honest. So I was very touched that they wanted to cover Tuffy's story in that. As a matter of fact, after Tuffy died and the species was believed to be extinct, this uh, headline came out in The Guardian, Frog Goes Extinct, Media Yawns. Um, and this is kind of synthesizes a little bit about why we do what we do at the Amphibian Foundation, because it says right here, how can the public care about global mass extinction if they aren't even told about its victims? So the last time a group of animals disappeared at this rate that the amphibians are disappearing, it was the dinosaurs. So think about that. And I thought I'd just go into a little bit about why are amphibians disappearing? First and foremost, and, and what we're talking about today is habitat. Habitat loss is a tremendous factor in causing the amphibian declines. Uh, a lot of the species we focus on at AF are uh, endemic to the longleaf pine ecosystem, which if you are unaware, has been reduced to 3% of its historic range. 97% of it is gone. And so all of the species that rely on that ecosystem are uh, imperiled. Uh, there's pollution, environmental contaminants are another main factor in amphibian declines, causing massive deformities and die-offs, causing extra limbs, not enough limbs. Certain chemicals turn male frogs into female frogs. Uh, it's a big mess. Amphibian skin is very sensitive. Um, they, you won't ever see a frog drink. They just absorb everything right through their skin and anything that we have put into the environment gets absorbed into the amphibian and they respond quite dramatically. Outdoor pet and feral cats is another massive influence on the cause of amphibian extinctions. Hundreds of millions of US amphibians are killed each year by feral and pet cats. That's every year. And then there's disease. So um, one thing that humans have done inadvertently is uh, moved diseases from areas where amphibians have a resistance to areas where amphibians have where the amphibians have no resistance. And so this has affected amphibians even in very pristine environments where you would you would think that the amphibians would be doing just fine, but then a, a fungal disease like chytrid can be moved into these pristine environments and wipe out 85% of the amphibians like what's happened in Panama. Okay, so now a little bit of history on AF. Uh, August 9th, 2016, my wife and I started the Amphibian Foundation in our basement. What you see on the right there, that picture, is um, our, it's uh, the world's only captive colony of the critically endangered frosted flatwood salamander. So we started the Amphibian Foundation specifically to focus on this species that was going extinct so rapidly, something had to be done immediately. And so we rallied and we started um, the foundation to protect the frosted flatwood salamander, which is a uh, native Georgia, uh, South Carolina, Georgia, and Florida species that was just disappearing incredibly rapidly. And we'll talk about this species more. Um, a couple months later, we moved into the Blue Heron Nature Preserve where we are now. That's on Roswell Road in, in Buckhead. And here's our facility. And then here's a little bit of a tour if you haven't been there. Um, this is our salamander lab and some more of our, uh, our labs. 
including our outdoor lab, our amphibian research and conservation center, where we've built 33 miniature habitats called mesocosms. And here's us building these uh, mesocosms. The nickname for this area is Metamorphosis Meadow. And we have these little ephemeral wetlands for growing endangered amphibian species. Like I said, we have 33 of them and we can uh, experimentally control them, make sure the animals have everything they need in there and uh, everything they need to make baby uh, endangered amphibians. It's right on the preserve. So this is the Blue Way Trail that cuts right through Blue Heron Nature Preserve. So we have signage there so people could learn about the amphibians, hopefully not mess with them. And then indoor holding, we have, this is our salamander lab. And I have some more to tell you about this as well, but this is where we hold um, a lot of our flatwood salamanders here. We have a tropical rain chamber where we breed tropical species as well. It's very loud because they're always singing. So this was a fun project uh, to put together and it ended up being really nice. This is inside of our classroom. So we felt so good about this uh, tropical rain chamber that we invited uh, the community to come uh, to the grand opening. So it was finally ready for frogs. But at this moment here, there wasn't a single frog in it. So we actually let the kids put the frogs in that first day and they love it in there. So here's a little kid putting a frog in there. I'm poking it in the butt so it jumps in. Here is our squamate lab. This is uh, squamate is a term for the close, re closely related group of snakes and lizards. So here's where we hold our snakes and lizards, which we use for education and outreach. You know, things like anacondas and indigo snakes, and skinks and stuff like that. Here's our amphibian lab. So I'm just giving you a quick virtual tour. Here's our amphibian lab. And here's another view of it. There's a few hundred amphibians in this room. We have... Um, we have a behind the scenes tour scheduled during the Atlanta Science Festival in March. So fingers crossed, COVID won't cancel that. But if, if we're online, uh, you can come during March and see all this if you'd like to. Here's our classroom. It's super amphibious because of all these wonderful pictures um, that were donated by one of our board members, Joel Sartori, who is a great National Geographic photographer. And he, uh, donated this Vanishing Amphibians exhibit to us. Um, and, you know, it was just like, I'd love to give it to you, but do you have room for it? I'm like, well, we will make room for that because it has created the perfect vibe for our classroom. <laughs> and then I would like to highlight our amazing partners. And it's the only reason why we've been able to do what we do. And we have done a lot of great work with a lot of great organizations and people in the community. Okay, so let me tell you a little bit about our high priority conservation programs and their relationship with their habitats. Uh, I had mentioned this species already, this cute little thing is the frosted flatwood salamander. So this is why we started and it's our still our highest priority project. Here's another shot. This is an adult. You know, pe people don't get to see these. They're, even when they weren't critically endangered, they were still, they were so mysterious that most people don't see them. You know, if you're out, uh, well, 30 years ago, if you were out on the right rainy night, you might see the road covered with these things. Um, those days are done, but you know that even so, if you weren't at the right time, 
you might never know that this species existed because of how secretive they are. There are actually two species of flatwood salamanders. There's the reticulated on the left and the frosted on the right. And I can't tell them apart visually, uh, but genetically they are distinct species separated by the Apalachicola River. Here's uh, our partners working with us on this project. And you know the flatwood salamanders just declined by 90% since 1999. So that's precipitous. Um, and it is a longleaf pine endemic. And that is one of the main reasons why this species is declining because it's longleaf pine habitat is gone. Um, there are two other main reasons why as well, aside from the fact that its habitat is gone, uh, the habitat that remains, even though it's protected, is, um, is not being burned properly for flatwood salamanders or bur burned at all. And this is a species that requires summer fire, summer growing seeds and burns, lots of it yearly or every other year. They, uh, their habitat historically burned very frequently every one to three years in the summer. And their ecology has mirrored that. They know to be underground during those times of year. Um, and so they're very attuned to this uh, seasonal fires. And also um, they are, their habitat is very intimate with the hydro period and rain and, and the seasonality of rain. And when that is disturbed through climate change and shifting weather patterns, that is really effectively shortening their breeding season to a huge degree. And it's already painfully short. Um, so here is the historic range of the flatwood salamander prior to 1999. And here is their current range. And so that is dramatic, but I'm gonna show it to you again. So here's their historic range. And here's the current range of the frosted flatwood salamander. Uh, you'll see <clears throat> there's one dot in South Carolina. That is the Francis Marion National Forest. Uh, we still survey that area every year, but we have not found them there in 13 years. Um, the one orange dot in Georgia is Fort Stewart Military Base, which used to have 24 occupied ponds and now has a single occupied wetland, one wetland left in the entire state that is known to have flatwood salamanders in it. Uh, and then in Florida, there are two clusters, St. Mark's uh, National Wildlife Refuge and Apalachicola National Forest. And both of those populations are declining as well. So you can see that this species is very close, uh, imminent risk of extinction. And that's the reason why we started the foundation to just try and safeguard this species before it was gone forever. Here I zoomed in on these habitats for you. Um, and then if you're curious, the blue dots are the other flatwood salamander, the bishopite reticulated. So uh, this is our crew. We survey that one wetland in, uh, it, in Georgia and all of the uh, historical wetlands where the species used to occur. We hit those every year and, and um, I just rally a team to, to, to go down out there and meet up with the Fort Stewart biologists and start surveying these wetlands with these nets. So that's a lot of fun and it's a lot of work, but it is a lot of fun. You can see the longleaf pine habitat in the background. When we go out there to look for these salamanders, as I said, they're incredibly mysterious. We are looking for their larvae. That's usually the easiest way to find flatwood salamanders is by surveying for the tadpoles, if you will, um, because the adults are underground um, and the larvae are the easiest to find with nets. So we go through the wetlands with dip nets and try to find some, some larvae. And it's impossible to find them with just with your eyes because their pattern is built to blend in with flooded grasslands and they are, they are practically invisible. 
but occasionally we do find them and it's very exciting. Um, so we have, like I said, we have the world's only captive colony. We have the only permit that exists for, for collecting this species to build uh, an assurance colony. So uh, originally we built this assurance colony to uh, protect them from going extinct. So we would have some living salamanders if the rest of them all disappeared or continue to disappear at the rate they're currently disappearing at. And um, this is a species that has a very strange natural history. Um, as I mentioned, they're very connected to their habitat and the hydro period, and the type of environment, and they breed in ponds, ephemeral wetlands, but they only breed in them when the ponds are dry. They lay their eggs in dry ponds and then they leave. The eggs will develop and wait in these dry ponds. Seasonal rains will fill the ponds. And then once the water gets high enough, the eggs get inundated and they hatch. So you can see how intimate that relationship is with their seasonal weather patterns. And when those rains don't come or they come too early or come too late, then the eggs don't hatch. And sure, that happens from time to time, but it's happening more frequently, more often, more often than not. These rains are not coming when they were predictably used to come and eggs are left in the field to dry. So we collect those eggs um, and our partners collect those eggs and, and bring them to us. So we have these eggs here, which were collected at Apalachicola National Forest and we hatched them in the lab. So we got little spoons. You can see in the cutout there, there's a little salamander inside of an egg. Get a little spoon. And these eggs are so past the point where they would have hatched naturally that a single drop of water caused them to hatch immediately. There's a little larvae and a spoon. We're very excited about our flatwood salamanders. <laughs> Here is one of uh, the larvae after it's hatched and has, has begun to grow. Here's one that's right at metamorphosis where it has its larval striping. And then it's also the beginnings of its adult patterning coming in. Here's one that just metamorphosed and is taking its very first clumsy steps. And I thought it was very cute, so I filmed it. Look at this goofy thing. But over the last few years, we have gotten very good at growing up healthy adult salamanders from these very stressed, dried out eggs that we are collecting from the field. So uh, the next phase was to try to breed this species. Here's some more of our animals. So we set up, um, a bunch of those outdoor mesocosms for these animals. And here's a bunch of our lab reared animals that we brought outside. Here's uh, some that we're getting ready to release. Look at the one in the middle there, he's bogeying. They're just beautiful, beautiful salamanders. And here's one, we released them into our mesocosms and it just seemed like right at home, like it liked it very much. And then, so I thought I'd share some breaking news with y'all because this is apropos. Uh, we have not released this to the public, but what you're seeing right there is the first egg that has ever been produced in captivity um, for flatwood salamanders. So we have successfully bred the flatwood salamander for the first time. Uh, this is a monumental occasion for us and the ultimate reason why we even started the Amphibian Foundation. And so um, this picture right here was just before Christmas, two days before Christmas. I came in to check on the salamanders with my little boy and he was like, uh, dad, I think there's eggs in there. And I was like, yeah, yeah. And he's like, oh, dad, I think there's eggs in there. And uh, he was right. And it was amazing. And we did a happy dance for quite a long time. And so now <clears throat> that's uh, such a good 
such good news, never been done uh, before. And now we finally have a recipe where we can export it to other facilities. And hopefully we can produce thousands of flatwood salamanders every year. That's our goal. But just thought I'd share that with you all because it's uh, we're feeling pretty good about it. And <clears throat> we hope to get the word out uh, next week. You don't have to keep it secret or anything, but we're gonna make a public announcement next week. Here's some more eggs. So our female, one of our females has been laying a lot of eggs for multiple days. So here's 14 eggs under a leaf. <clears throat> and then more recently, a second female has started breeding too. So we have two groups of, of uh, eggs being produced right now. Woohoo. And so there, look at that face. You know, just ask where we're, we just had this tremendous success. And, you know, we have to think about the habitat and habitat restoration. Where will the babies go? There are protected places in the wild right now where these salamanders are still disappearing. So we don't want to put our babies out there. They're, already, they're still disappearing out there. We have to work with partners who are restoring habitat and managing it properly. Um, and so that's one thing about, you know, habitat restoration can get pretty complicated when you're talking about longleaf pine because you have to have the right vegetation composition, but you also have to have people willing to burn this uh, at the, in, during the natural burn cycles, you know? So otherwise, the salamanders are going to perish, you know, a lot of, and it's completely understandable, but a, a lot of burn, controlled burning happens in the winter where it's easier to burn. There's not as much fuel, but naturally these burns would come through in the late spring and summer. And if you burn in the winter time when it's easier, the salamanders are up. The salamanders literally get burned up. And also their, their wetlands are full during the winters and their wetlands don't burn like they need to. And the wetlands get overgrown and that can make it unsuitable for flywood salamanders. So these things like it just right and nature knew how to provide that for them. And now it can get very complicated. So here's just an image of some uh, longleaf pine. You can see the grasses in the front and the trees, and um, it's pretty widespread. I mean, there's not a lot of shade. These are salamanders that get a lot of direct hot sun. Um, and so once these trees get to, uh, if, if burns are prohibited, then these longleaf pine trees will get displaced um, by more, more hardwood trees will shade out uh, shade out all the grasses and, and uh, understory and the habitat will no longer be suitable for flatwood salamanders. Flatwood salamanders need these wide open pine savannas with wire grass. And, um, and, and, and once the fires are stopped, then that changes pretty quickly. So I have this image from when we were first looking in that last this is the last wetland in Georgia that has flatwood salamanders. And you can see there's a pretty dense tree cover. It's pretty shady in there. Um, and this is when I was just starting um, researching flatwood salamanders. So I, I really didn't know better. But here's the Alpha 10 pond in 2014. This is on the Fort Stewart Army base. And then here's that same pond five years later. So it is much more wide open. And so a lot of really positive restoration work has gone in here, but it being on a military base, there's a lot of control about when you can and cannot burn. So a lot of these trees had to be mechanically removed, like literally cut down and carted off. And that is um, labor intensive, I guess you could say. Um, but at any rate, I'd like to show that there is some really great restoration work being done at Fort Stewart, um, but we haven't found salamanders out there in the last two years. Okay, 
So uh, I wanted to make sure I covered the, the flatwood salamanders solidly because you know it's, it's our highest priority and we have this tremendous news. This is the first time I've gotten to share it at all with the public. So it felt really good. And I see that we are because I, I can get talking on and on about this stuff. So I'm gonna go a little bit faster with these slides as I see we're nearing the, um, it's already 740. Michelle, any questions though? Um, we have a question um, on more like, do you, do you offer like volunteer opportunities for groups? I don't know if oh. you're planning to maybe cover that later on, but if you can maybe yes. later talk about volunteer opportunities for groups and individuals, that'll be great. I will talk about that. And yes, we do. Thank you. Okay. That sounds great. Um, so let me just tell you a little bit about the gopher frog. This is Georgia's rarest frog. Isn't it cute? <clears throat> Been head starting these frogs, which means, you know, collecting eggs from the wild, rearing them for through metamorphosis and releasing baby frogs. So that's thought to give them a little jump because a lot of things like to eat gopher frog tadpoles. So if we release them as baby frogs, maybe they'll have a slight advantage. So I've been releasing baby gopher frogs back out into Georgia since 2009. Once they metamorphose though, they like to eat each other. So we have to keep them in individual cups, not very convenient. Uh, and then we've been releasing them. So um, we've gotten some evidence that our baby frogs have grown into adult frogs and started making their own baby frogs. So that feels really good. So that's a positive sign, but gopher frogs need a lot more work. Um, there's probably as many as a dozen wetlands in the state with gopher frogs. We started recently with a captive propagation program or breeding program for gopher frogs. So here's my wife and co-founder Crystal holding one of our adult gopher frogs where we're gonna start breeding gopher frogs so that we can release some babies that are born right at the amphibian foundation. So this is the day we set up our breeding groups. And it's the same question, where will our babies go? You know, we have to make sure that there's properly restored and maintained habitat. It's not just about restoration, it's about maintaining it afterwards as well, because a lot of times these habitats need maintenance. And the striped newt, this is another imperiled species here in South Georgia in, in the southeastern United States. We have already bred and released striped newts in the wild. So there are more striped newts now than when we started, which feels really good. Here's some of our baby newts. Baby newts get tattooed. That's how we can keep track of them. So they get these little tattoos right before we release them. Here's the tattoo team. Uh, and that way, when we detect them the following years, we know when they were released and um, as much information as we want to collect on them. Here's one that we're releasing into the wild. We feel very good about that. Okay, pigeon mountain salamanders and blue spots are two more species we're working with, but I'm going to try to make a little bit more headway because I know I'm running out of time. I apologize. Well, we do a lot of local restoration too here in Metro Atlanta that also involves a lot of habitat restoration back to the species I started with, my beloved spotted salamanders. They're just so, so cute and nice. Um, so we uh, have a community science program called the MAMP, the Metro Atlanta Amphibian Monitoring Program. Um, the website will be at the end if you'd like to learn more, or get involved in that. Um, through our MAMP, we have detected at the at first two breeding sites still with spotted salamanders. But we have started, through a partnership with Clyde Shepard, a third breeding site. And that was only because of the habitat restoration that had happened at Clyde Shepard. Otherwise, if Clyde Shepard didn't do that restoration work, it wouldn't support spotted salamanders there. 
Um, we're doing a similar project now at the History Center, and we've had some very encouraging results with salamanders doing well after we've released them there. Spotted salamanders lay spermatophore in their ponds. That's what all that white stuff is at the bottom. Those are little salamander sperm packets. Here's a close up. The female picks up the spermatophore and fertilizes her eggs. This is a big spotted salamander egg mass. And I just thought I'd highlight the fact that we do a salamander stroll at the Atlanta Science Festival every March as well. Uh, we're going to be doing one this March. Um, if you're interested, you know, it's a free event and we can see some of these spotted salamander eggs um, if we're lucky and lots and lots of other salamanders as well. So I think because there was a question about the volunteer opportunities that I will skip to that um, because we have a bunch of educational and training programs. Um, and so that involves our volunteers and our interns and our students. Um, <clears throat> so we do, we do provide a lot of opportunities for volunteers and for interns. And like I said, we, we don't look for people with experience. We look for people who want to contribute to conservation and we fully train everybody. So um, there are opportunities um, that you can get to on our website. The link is at the end. And then we do a lot of classes. Um, you know, I, we love teaching people about amphibians. Look how delighted everyone in that picture is that there's a big spotted salamander there. So that's a, a George Tech. Uh, I don't know why this is black. Oh, yes. Our bridge program is a program for um, uh, those leaving high school or those leaving college. There should be some pictures here. Yeah. So we provide one to three semester apprenticeships and mentored research programs in a variety of disciplines, all stemming back to conservation. And so this is a very hands on research oriented. Um, conservation research oriented apprenticeship. <clears throat> That's our bridge program for conservation research. Okay, and then we, you know, just teach straight up classes, uh, biology of the amphibians fall semesters at Agnes Scott through continuing ed. So you don't have to be a student at Agnes Scott to take this class. Same with the biology of the reptiles. It's always a fun class. Our master herpetologist program, um, we teach, uh, well, we teach in person when it's safe, uh, the Southeastern master herpetologist. And then we have our online master herpetologist program, which has been a lot of fun. Um, over these trying months, it's been a bright spot uh, where we've had students from all over the world coming and learning about reptiles and amphibians. Of course, our critters in Cabernet that we do the first Friday of every month, reptiles and wine, what could go wrong? That's our little slogan there. <clears throat> but most of our programs are centered around kids primarily Critter Camp, which we're going to be doing again for our, this summer will be our eighth summer. It's a reptile and amphibian summer camp, so obviously it's awesome. And then, yeah, lots of opportunities to get involved. Really, that's what we're all about, is providing opportunities for people who want to contribute to conservation. Um, there's our website there. Uh, amphibianfoundation.org. Um, there's our Critter Camp uh, website and also our Metro Atlanta Amphibian Monitoring Program website. And at the very bottom is our newsletter if you want to sign up there for our monthly newsletter. Okay, great. Not too bad. <laughs> Sorry, I had to rush it at the end there. Any questions? There, yeah, thank, thank you so much for this great presentation. And thank you for sharing those great news with us. How exciting. Oh, thank you, my pleasure. So we have a few questions here in the chat and the Q&A. So I'll go ahead and start with the first one. What will be, 
what will be an effective use of collective effort in conservation? Collective effort. Um, <clears throat> well, I'm not sure I'm understanding exactly, but I will say this, that 100% of our conservation programs are collaborative um, and it, they rely on a dedicated and passionate partner base. So um, I think that any, any effective effort will have to be collective. I don't think there's any way to do these types of projects alone. Our specialty is in um, keeping endangered amphibian species alive, but obviously we have to work hand in glove with land managers and habitat restoration managers and control, controlled burn operators. And it can get pretty complicated. So luckily all of our projects involve a large wide partner base that involves lots of different skill sets, but everyone's very impassioned about um, conservation and restoration. So hopefully that answers that question. And, and that's the same for um, a tree organization like Trees Atlanta. Collaboration, it's, it's very important. We wouldn't be able to do it ourselves. Exactly. Um, so another question from the Q&A, what should be done if we see a spotted salamander around this time? Should, it, should they be scouted under a lot, left alone? Should a wildlife service to be called? I appreciate that. Um, well, you know, because spotted salamanders are underground for 50 weeks of the year, if you see a spotted salamander, take a moment and realize how lucky you are that your timing <laughs> was just so perfect that you saw one of these. Um, but we are at the beginning of spotted salamander season. So if you were going to see one, it would be around this time. So just enjoy it and try to uh, get it, stay out of its way, you know, because it, it knows what it's doing. Um, and so it's got a mission right now, too, to make more baby salamanders. So I think just admire it from afar and let it do go on its way. All right. And now... Um question about um, breeding and, and releasing from captivity. Are there any challenges to breeding and releasing from captivity? More specifically, are there any challenges similar to what we might typically hear about with mammals and other natural instincts? Um, well, I'm not sure exactly what the challenges are specifically with mammals, but for us, you know, we have to be concerned with lots of things other than what I had mentioned already about making sure we're releasing into proper managed habitat. Uh, we also have to be concerned with, you know, transmission of diseases that could be detrimental to amphibians. Um, you know, that has happened in the past, not, not with us, but you could release a pathogen into the environment that could be really harmful. So we always have to be mindful of that sort, constantly testing our animals to make sure that they don't have any pathogens. So that's, that's one challenge. Um, you know, there's lots of other potential problems too. We wanna make sure that we're releasing animals that know how to fend for themselves. You know, so like I had mentioned the word coddled before, sometimes when you're raising things in captivity, you might have a tendency to make things easy on them. And you actually don't want to do that. You want these salamanders to be fierce, ferocious, so they can get out there and find their own food. Um, so, you know, these are different things that we have to keep in mind when we're producing animals, especially ones that we're producing to be released into the wild. That's great. And thank you, everybody, for their questions. Um, I see another one here. Do the salamanders get confused when releasing to the wild as far as where, like, as far as where to return to breed? Actually, they do. Um, not ours. So um, these salamanders, at least the ones that have been studied ex enough, they imprint on the wetland that they were born in at metamorphosis. 
So remember I told everyone about site fidelity where these animals return back to the pond they were born in. They imprint on that wetland when they change from larvae to terrestrial. And so we release our animals as larvae so that they will imprint on the wetland that they metamorphose in. And so one uh, event, one instance of a conservation program in California that raised their animals, their endangered salamanders in, in cattle tanks like we did, they let their animals metamorphose in the cattle tank and then took the animals to the pond and released them. And the next year they returned to the cattle tank. And so I don't even know what you do at that point because it's like, it's not where you wanted them to go. But it's interesting that they have such a strong homing uh, mechanism for these little tiny salamanders. So anyway, we focus on re re uh, releasing these animals and when they're still larvae. And so far as yet, we haven't had an issue with them returning to uh, a place we wouldn't want them to. Yeah, lots of things to have in consideration when releasing mm -hmm. them. It's mm -hmm. <laughs> a good question, though. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Well, um, looks like that was the last question. Um, okay. But thank you, Mark, for your time. Um, and thank you, everybody, for joining us today. And please visit his website and the Athena Foundation website to learn more. Um, and we hope to see you around. Have a great night. You too. Thanks, everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Yep. Bye-bye.